Welcome back to Sex, Brains and Money. I'm Nikki Thomas, sans bonbon. She was getting a little bit too feisty in my lap and I decided that it would be best if she sat the next segment out. Because this is going to be talking about a very important case that's going through the Canadian judicial system right now. It's Bedford, Scott and Leibovich versus the Attorney General of Canada and the Attorney General of Ontario. And basically, this it's a constitutional challenge that is seeking to decriminalize sex work in Canada. So I'll just give a little bit of the background. So back in 2007, three sex workers, Amy Leibovich, Valerie Scott, and Terry Jean Bedford, decided to challenge the laws surrounding sex work on constitutional grounds, stating that the laws forced sex workers to choose between their liberty and their security of the person, which is protected under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So I'm not going to go through all the details of the court challenge itself, but originally in 2010, Justice Susan Himmel of the Ontario Court of Appeal agreed with the challenge and effectively decriminalized sex work by striking three provisions of the criminal code. Section 210, which is the provision against holding a common bounty house, also known as a brothel. Section 212J, which is the living on the avails provision, which prevents sex workers from giving money to anybody who might support us in our, in our endeavors. And Section 213C, which is the provision against communicating in a public place for the purposes of solicitation of prostitution. Got all that? Okay. So after the first judgment came from Justice Susan Himmel, which struck down all three parts of the criminal code, the government decided to appeal, and it went to the Ontario Court of Appeal, which heard the case in June of 2011. In, on March 26th of this year, 2012, the Ontario Court of Appeal upheld Justice Susan Himmel's judgment on two of the three provisions. They agreed that the provision against holding a common bounty house was unconstitutional, and they held that the provision against living on the avails was unconstitutional, except in cases where exploitation is evident. And then in a three to two split, they elected to maintain the communicate for the purposes of prostitution uh, law, which was 213C, and said that it was constitutional. And this was the provision that most people had a big problem with because it primarily affects workers who work on the street. So I want to talk a little bit about what the differences are between indoor and outdoor types of workers. And I want you to suspend all of the stereotypes that you have about different types of sex work and ignore all of the very pervasive stereotypes and all of the you know, assumptions that we make about different people working in different ways. And just look at this from a pure marketing and advertising perspective. The only thing that a street-based prostitute is really doing is advertising. The way that she dresses, the way that she stands, the place that she holds herself in public are all indicators to the public of her availability for sexual transactions. And if you look at it purely from an, uh, an advertising or a marketing perspective, then it's a lot easier to sort of understand what the law does. Now there's no other legal profession where you're allowed to advertise a service or a product but not allowed to communicate with potential customers about exactly what the terms and conditions of your arrangement are. And that's what Section 213C prevents. It, it makes it illegal for anybody to communicate in a public place about anything pertaining to prostitution. That means that police officers can engage in sting operations where female police officers pose as prostitutes looking to lure potential clients in. And the moment that they start discussing anything in detail, such as specific services or prices or time, that's when it becomes illegal. So they can arrest people on those grounds. But it also means that sex workers who are advertising on the street are prohibited from discussing any of those details with their potential clients. Now, some of you might have read this on my blog already, which is www.misnickythomas.com, and you might have seen a shorter version of that same article on the Huffington Post blog that I do. But the thing that the communicating law prohibits is something that I call critical distance. Critical distance is physical and temporal distance between a client and a provider. It's what makes it possible for me as an indoor worker who works primarily through the internet and over the phone to screen my clients appropriately to ensure accountability. 
Now, when you think about it, accountability is the one and only thing that stops us from engaging in basically anarchy. The fact that you can be held responsible for your actions is usually enough to stop you from doing something bad. Maybe the driver who cut you off pissed you off so badly that you want to pull out a gun and shoot them in the head. But you don't because you'll be held accountable for your actions. Most of the violence against sex workers is opportunistic because people don't feel that they'll be held accountable for their actions. So when I'm screening clients, I ask them for very basic information such as their name, their email address, cell phone number, basic physical description, age, things along those lines. So I have some idea of who it is that's going to be knocking on my door when I agree to see them. That's accountability. And the client knows before he even comes to see me that if he takes any liberties with me in any way, shape, or form, he'll be held accountable for his actions. A street-based sex worker is doing nothing more than advertising her availability, but she's not allowed to acquire that information to hold the client accountable. She's not allowed to communicate with other sex workers to, for example, give them the license plate of the client that she's going to see because that would be considered public communication for the purposes of solicitation. And that's a very basic safety mechanism that we already have built into our, in our mode of business because we work through the internet or over the phone. But street-based sex workers, not only do they have to put up with the fact that predators are targeting them for violence far more than they are targeting indoor workers, but they don't even have the ability to take very basic safety precautions by communicating with other people to keep themselves safe. So when the Supreme Court of Canada yesterday agreed that they would hear the Bedford appeal from the government, they also agreed to hear an appeal cross appeal that was launched by the applicants to try and get the Supreme Court of Canada to overrule the Ontario Court of Appeals judgment on the 213C provision. And this is critically important because it's a very, very basic safety mechanism that street-based workers can take to keep themselves safe. And for the government to say that it's a reasonable restriction is ludicrous. The actual act of communicating two people talking to each other in public is not the least bit of a problem or a nuisance. You think about two business people who are walking down the street together just chatting about what sort of business opportunities they're going to have with each other. You think of two people on Bay Street talking about the different stocks and bonds that they want to trade. That is public communication for the purposes of conducting business. And street-based sex workers deserve the exact same right because all they're doing is talking to their clients and to each other to keep themselves safe. So I'm really pleased to hear that the Supreme Court of Canada is going to hear the cross appeal and hopefully within the next two years that ridiculous provision known as 213C will be struck from the criminal code and street-based sex workers will be able to protect themselves against predators in a much better way than they have before. So that's the end of my sex work related rant today. We're going to take another break and then come back with Leo Ferraro who's going to talk about This is Your Brain on Sex. Stay tuned. Yeah.